Thank everyone for coming. I know there's uh, competing programming going on now. Last I checked, it was uh, 22-11, the, the bad guys in the basketball game. So <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll make sure to update you as that goes on. This is a, a, a really big moment for me because this is actually the first time I've seen stacks of my book. The, the publication date is in a few days, but it's a little bit like delivering a baby, getting to hold your book for the first time. Though my wife doesn't necessarily think that I'm allowed to make that comparison, never having done it myself. But I do want to start with two stories about fatherhood. One is my first moments as a dad. <clears throat> one is uh, one of my favorite sort of funny recurring moments. So when our child was born, I remember just so many of the emotions something I call the, the burden of love, where it was weighing on me, I, I couldn't sleep, I was, I was so happy, I was so intimidated by the idea that the rest of my life now was going to be partly dedicated to this, this brand new person. And while my wife was sleeping, I, I walked out into the hallway very bleary-eyed, and I remember this face staring down at the, it was a makeshift, um, makeshift nursery in the hallway. And this little bassinet, I'm staring down at this perfect little face and thinking, what is she going to look like when she's a toddler? Is she going to be a big sister who takes care of her siblings? Where is she going to go to college? Is she going to get married and, and give me grandkids? And I'm thinking about all these things, and that's when the nurse says, sir, your, your baby is three bassinets over. <laughs> You're currently staring at someone else's child. I, I still sometimes wonder what happened to that girl, too. But <laughs> this is a few years later. Now, I don't, um, this is not our full family, so two have been born since then. But so this is a story of when people say, oh my gosh, we're in Washington, D.C., it's not normal to have six or even four children. Oh my gosh, how do you do it? That's when I start talking about my systems. I've got lots of systems. And one is when we go to the zoo, I don't pay for parking, because you know, you got to find savings somewhere. You park on the street where it's free on Saturday. But the Washington, D.C. Zoo is a long downhill. So I realized you have to slowly check every, you know, hit the exhibits, hit the different animals. You end at the bottom with the lions and the tigers. And then there's no more checking out the animals. You load the kids, and you just march up the hill, like a, a military march. But you could fit four, you see, on the stroller, the little scooter on the back. So only the oldest two have to walk on either side. We've got this march. They've got their water. One of the things is that then the zoo goers react to you when you're doing this. And you see people smile, you see people laugh. At one point I saw a kid pull his dad's hand away from the sea lions, say, Dad, Dad, look there. <laughs> we had gone to the zoo and became an exhibit. <laughs> and this, um, it, it speaks to a few different things. One, my systems aren't really that valuable in all of this. But two, large families are increasingly rare in most of the country. So, but to go back to that first moment, 2006, we were in this overflow nursery because a lot of babies were being born. A lot of people don't remember this, but there was a huge uptick in birth. So this would have been when most of you students were in high school. All the famous people were having babies. You had Brad Pitt and Angelina Jolie. You had Tom Cruise and Katie Holmes. They had Surrey Cruise. Um, Britney Spears had a baby. Heidi Klum had a baby. And they called it a baby boomlet. Uh, birth rate was going high. So then in 2007, even more people had babies, trying to imitate Tom Cruise, Brad Pitt, and me. And so <laughs> we had the highest number of births in US history in 2007. And at this point, the millennials, which were a much larger generation than my generation, Gen X, were just hitting their prime childbearing years. So we were supposed to have a baby boom at that point. We didn't. The number of babies born has dropped almost every year since 2007. Uh, this graph ends at the uh, pandemic, but let me put it this way. Despite some uptick, we will probably have fewer than 3.6 million babies in, when 2023 is all done being counted. The total fertility rate is a number a lot of you guys see. So this is the average. It's a modeled number of how many babies are born per woman in a society. The red line is a replacement level, 2.1. We ticked above that in 2006 and 2007. And we've been plummeting. Sorry about the, the y-axis from the federal government. It's not going down to zero, but we are down between 1.6 and 1.7 babies per woman, half a baby short of what it would take to keep our population stable, if not for immigration and other demographic effects. So what are the results? There are actually fewer children in America, not percentage, but number, fewer children in America than there were 10 years ago. 
This is a, a little data visualization that's normally called the age pyramid. In the US, it's sort of an age onion, where you see the, there's this, uh, it gets smaller at the bottom. Other countries are a lot worse than this, obviously, and we can talk about that in the questions. So one question I always get is, why should I care that there are fewer babies being born? This is a, a friendly interlocutor of mine. She's a, a liberal feminist, and she, when I was tweeting about this, she said, considering that overpopulation is quite literally killing the planet, what does it matter that the birth rate is down? Why do you insist on more births? Some people think I'm, uh, I want some Handmaid's Tale type thing. Some people think I'm a, a white supremacist who cares about the dying of the, the white race. A lot of people just think it's weird to care about a falling birth rate. So I offer four quick reasons to care. One, is economic. The dependency ratio. The number of retirees is hitting, is a record high, a new record every day. Pretty soon we will have fewer workers in the workforce. That's gonna be a problem. Number two, despite what some, uh, what the average columnist at the Washington Post says, women do actually want babies. Number three, the baby bus reflects something unwell about our culture. And this is gonna be the most important thing I wanna stress, these last two. Even if you don't care about there being fewer children and fewer babies, the things that's causing it are themselves bad and have other negative effects. And number four, I believe that babies are actually good and fewer of them is bad. So just, I'll, I'll do this part quickly. Um, as far as the dependency ratio, we have more people in their 60s than under age 10. So what does that mean in 20 years? The workforce will be shrinking while the number of retirees will still be growing. The working age population you see as sort of flatlined after steadily growing. And this is before even counting the post-2007 uh, Great Recession. So the number, the working age population will soon be shrinking. What does that mean? Well, it's probably good for the job prospects of the people who are currently 12, but for those of us who will be retired 20 years from now, it means there are fewer people around to fix our leaky pipes. Sorry that it's tweaking in and out like that. Neither private savings, this is an economist writing, neither private savings nor government pension schemes work unless there are enough workers to meet the needs of older Americans. Now, maybe uh, artificial intelligence will improve and Google Gemini will be perfectly good at taking care of you in your old age, but there will certainly at least be a, a ramp up about it and <clears throat> there will be certainly costs to it. So another problem is that we still want kids. Again, this is a poll Gallup does, the ideal number of children. 2.7 is what it is. It's actually been rising. So we're having 1.6, 1.7, and people still want 2.7. So the natural question is, if we want more kids, why aren't we having them? So here, I'm gonna tell a story. That's a picture from the Lower Avenues, if any of you know your, your way around Salt Lake City. A neighborhood I visited because somebody said, I was kind of complaining about the layout of Salt Lake City. I think the, the streets are too wide and the, the blocks are too long. And I've heard stories that that had to do with Brigham Young wanting to do U-turns in his horse-drawn carriage. <laughs> I never ask if architectural legends are true because they're all awesome. So just, just take them. A lot, half my friends went to a college that they say was originally designed to be a prison. And it's like, okay, that's a great story. But, so, but the lower avenues is not the streets are too wide and the roads are, are too wide. Uh, the blocks are too long. It looked to me like the perfect place to raise children. So I walked around there for a day. For hours, I didn't see any families at all. And so then finally I ran into this one couple. Their name was Isaac and Nicole. And I said, hey, I'm here. I'm writing about family and, and birth rates and childhood anxiety, et cetera. And they said, well, we don't want kids. I said, why not? And Nicole said, too expensive. We can't afford it. And I said, what specifically is not affordable? And Isaac said, everything. Healthcare, then he cut himself off. He said, if I'm, on, if I'm being honest, it's really just that I'm selfish. Then he said, Nicole and I often joke that someone, that other people are cleaning up vomit and watching Teletubbies while we're going to be drinking margaritas in Paris. And at this point though, a neighbor walked up, said hi, pushing her double stroller. The passengers in the double stroller were both chihuahuas. <laughs> So I was reeling from this whole interaction. First, because it was like that novel, Children of Men, with the Chihuahua double stroller. Second, um, 
I don't know why you would go to Paris to drink margaritas. That's not, <laughs> not the most natural combination. But third, those reasons he gave, affordability and selfishness, are the two most common reasons I get for why we're not having kids. I think they're both inadequate. And I'll, I'll race through this in case you guys want more questions. But we had more babies during the recession than we do now, or did right before the pandemic. Um, uh, economists have looked into it and on a local level found that where rent goes up the most, that doesn't seem to drive the birth rate down anymore. Where the birth rate's lower, those aren't the places with increasing student loan debt or child care costs. So geographically, the economic changes don't predict the demographic changes. Also, millennials are just not poorer than my generation and probably not the baby boomers. Again, this is work by an economist, Jeremy Horpadal. There's lots of reasons to think it's not that it's more unaffordable to have kids. It's, uh, and again, there's tons of data that I put in the book about that. So then the other explanation, selfishness. I don't think you can explain a fall in the birth rate by selfishness any more than you could explain a rise in plane crashes by pointing to gravity. I do not think that selfishness is on the rise. If I'd made a chart for this slide, it would have been selfishness is zero, Adam and Eve eat the fruit, it goes up to 100, and then it's been flat since then. <laughs> selfishness is a constant state in humanity. But what we have is we have civilizations and cultures, and their job is to mitigate our selfishness, to redirect our personal self-interest towards the common good. And so that's why I think the falling birth rates is a reflection of a cultural failure. Another data point, these are the OECD countries. These are basically the wealthy countries in the world. What is their birth rate? The average is 1.5. The one outlier on the far right, that's Israel. Israel isn't richer, it isn't poor. It's the average of those. Their educational attainment is a little bit above. They don't have a much more generous welfare state. They're about median on that. What they have is a very distinctive culture. And Russell Kirk had a great line that said, if you want to understand what culture is, some people will say it's language, it's food, it's music, largely it's religion. So this is Lyman Stone, he's a great uh, demographer. That top yellow line is the uh, predicted, basically the birth rate of women who attend uh, church services at least once a week. That's above replacement. The red line is religious people who don't go every week, and the blue line is non-religious. So if you start over on that far right uh, 25%, you see a divergence. They're going up and down, a lot of them, but the main thing is that the religious and the non-religious are diverging in their birth rates. What this doesn't show, though, is that the, no the number of non-religious in America is growing. So that blue line would be getting thicker if it represented shares of the population. So one good illustration of this, I asked which county in America has the most births per person, and it was Madison County, Idaho. And I thought, what the heck is in Madison County, Idaho? <laughs> so I went there, and I've got a little excerpt I wanted to read you from that one. <clears throat> So in, stroll along College Avenue in Rexburg, and one of the first things you'll notice is Mariah's Bridal Shop, followed a few doors down by Baby Swag, a boutique that sells baby clothes. A block or two later, where College Avenue hits Main Street, you'll find Main Street diamonds. They mostly deal in engagement rings. If you take a right on Main, there's a slightly higher end bridal shop. The brand new wedding venue is a few blocks away. Let me tell you, this is not normal for a college avenue in most of America. <laughs> I went to the Red Rabbit Grill down the road and the hostess explained, that's why we call it BYU I Do. <laughs> she said the mattress store across Main Street does half its business selling double and queen beds to undergrad newlyweds. Again, I started to check that. I decided that detail is better left unchecked. I'll just leave that. <laughs> BYU-Idaho is the most important institution in Madison County, which is what makes Madison County, by some counts, the biggest exception to our baby bust. Madison, uh, what's more, the women at, who go to the college, as the shops on College Avenue and Main Street indicate, get married and have babies much more than the average American woman. There are nearly twice as many births per woman of childbearing age in Madison County compared to the, US, the average U.S. county. 
So I went to Rexburg, and the first couple, literally the first people I ran into, I get out of my car, I start walking, I, I run into this one couple walking up, and uh, they're both sophomores, Hannah and Jonathan, and they say, we just got married last week. <laughs> I, I, so I think early marriage is a great idea, but you're taking your honeymoon in sophomore bio is not the optimal <laughs> life plan in, in my, uh, but anyway, so who's having babies? But I, I want to drill down on the, the nature of religion. Um, sociologist Sarah Hayford wrote a paper that looked at it and found that the religious teachings, so I'm a Catholic, our, our teachings say artificial contraception is, is not allowed, but that doesn't seem to make a difference for the average Catholic. And she found religious teachings about fertility rated behavior and institutional enforcement of these norms are less important components of the relationship between religious and birth rates than the cultural components. I went to Israel, and I specifically went to Tel Aviv, which is the most secular part of Israel, and I interviewed people. And first I saw a guy pushing his three kids on a stroller, a lot like me, and I asked him, he said he was totally secular, and his exact quote was, God has nothing to do with our children making decisions. And similarly, a woman picking up her three kids from school uh, said, well, so mitzvah gets translated as uh, commandment, and God's first commandment was be fruitful and multiply. And this one Israeli Jewish mother said, it's not a mitzvah for me. She's totally secular. She has three kids. Secular Israeli Jews have a total fertility rate of 2.0. So that is secular people in Israel have more babies than the average American. So something is happening that trickles out of just religious belief. So my image of Israel is a, a fruitful garden. The center tree there is Israel. Sorry, my brother made this for me on uh, one of those AIs, so it doesn't have as many squirrels and, and berries as I would like. But that central tree is religion. A lot of people eat of religion as, as their fruit, and that helps them um, have more kids. It's the mitzvah, it's the commandment. The other two trees in Israel are gonna be their geopolitical situation and their tribal history. Even if you don't eat of any of those trees, what's created is an ecosystem, a garden, that's fertile, that allows shrubs to grow up, that gives a home to all sorts of other animals. And that ecosystem is the culture. It's the little things that make it family friendly. And so that is why the baby bus reflects something unwell about our culture. Our broader culture is not a good habitat for humans and babies. I'll get back to uh, religion in a second. I'm just gonna race through the other stuff. Parenting culture has gone haywire. Parents, mothers spend 50% more time just taking care of their kids and doing nothing else than their grandmothers did, despite the fact that mothers are more likely to work outside the home and families are smaller. High intensity parenting, that's what my first two chapters are on. And some sociologists say that's good. We're trading, we're giving up quantity for quality, is what they say. I don't think it's quality, and I don't like the implication that those of us with a high quantity of kids are low quality, but. I, I spent a lot of time arguing that that's not true. And that the, it's not quality is evidenced by the fact that rise in mental disorders um, has, has been attributed to the lack of independent play. I could go on at length about modern dating and how I think the apps rewire our brains in a, in a way that's averse to actual uh, dating culture, but I just wanna cut to the sort of more philosophical part of that. This is a feminist writer. Louise Perry, she says, today's sexual culture prefers to understand people as freewheeling, atomized individuals, all looking out for number one and up for a good time. It assumes that if sexual taboos were abolished, we would be liberated and making entirely free choices about our sexual lives. That idea of atomizing us, that's at the heart of our modern dating culture, and it's at the heart of our broader culture. Stephanie Murray is a great writer. She wrote, children are a personal choice, therefore a personal problem, many seem to believe. Have as many as you want, just make sure they don't bother the rest of us. So something that's inherently a communal undertaking becomes an individual undertaking. This is a Republican Senator, Ron Johnson, opposing a tax credit for families. He said, you decide to have families and become parents, that cost is something they need to consider when they make that choice. I never felt it was society's responsibility to take care of other people's children. We can debate, uh, we should talk about tax credits and that sort of stuff, but the fact that society's not supposed to help people take care of their children, that's a new idea. That's an unhealthy idea. 
I was going to write this book all built around Miley Cyrus, but I won't, and so I'll, I'll, I'll race through these slides. But the idea that the planet is a horrible place to bring children is one of the th reasons she says she'll never have kids. When I was a kid, there was an op-ed in the New York Times saying, no problem facing the Earth looms larger than the growth of the reproductive rate of human species. All human suffering, virtually all human suffering, can be attributed to the crushing effect of a population that is too numerous for our planet. In other words, we've been having it hammered into our head that we are bad. Specifically, this op-ed was saying, we need to teach kids that they're the problem, that babies are the problem, that overpopulation is the problem. The author was a principal of John Pettibone School, a public elementary school in New Milford, Connecticut. As a side note, the John Pettibone School closed 10 years ago due to low and falling enrollment. <laughs> there is now a dog park and a senior center in its place. So again, there's this belief that overpopulation is killing the planet, leading to the fact that Americans are a lot more pessimistic about the future than we were just a few years ago. A lot of that centers around climate. And Ezra Klein, a columnist at the New York Times, argues that the fear about the future is really a guilt about what we've done. Miley Cyrus said, we don't want to reproduce because we know the Earth can't handle it. Handle what? Handle us. Handle humans. Handle babies. Think about that. The Earth can't handle us. That's the mindset behind this. So I call it civilizational sadness. There's this woman, Amanda, um, who I met while working on this. And I told her I had six kids. And she said, that sounds terrible. She said she didn't want kids. And then later, I asked her her opinion on the human race. And she said, in general, do I think people are good? No. I don't. I think we're the cancer of the earth. Pope Francis rightly says that birth rates reflect the amount of happiness in a society. So again, even if you don't care about there being fewer babies, it reflects that something is wrong. In the book, I argue that the baby boom was caused by the fact that we actually thought we were good. The men got off the boat having just defeated Hitler and the Japanese Empire, and the women were on the dock having just kept the economy going for four years. They met on the pier, smooched, got married, and had a bunch of babies that, because they believed in human goodness. Germany, Japan, and Italy did not have a baby boom. Because when they asked, are we good, their answer is no. But I think we are good. This is just an economic way of showing it. The red bar at the bottom is a number of people living in extreme poverty. So you see, first, a percentage of it started to drop. The green is the number of people not in poverty. But then the number of red started to drop. Who caused human well-being to increase? Was it space aliens? Was it you know, artificial intelligence? Was this Google Gemini's doing? No. It was other people caused human happiness to thrive. I put in economist's term, the expected value of each human is positive. And so that is one of the, the key aspects of this, that our religious places build cultures that then support and accommodate families. But most importantly, they drive home the idea that, yes, you may be a sinner. You may do lots of bad things, but ultimately, you're still good. And that idea that you can do bad things and have caused harm and feel guilt yourself, but still know that you're good and that more of you would be better, that's one of the most uh, painful losses in our increasingly secular age. People look at themselves and they think, we are not good. But the terrible, terrible irony of that is that if you've ever held your baby in your hands and you look at them, two things overcome you. One, and they're going to sound the opposite, but joy and a little bit of guilt. As a Catholic, I'm very used to mixing those things together. Our, our whole Advent se season is joy and guilt. And in Advent, they're, like, they're the same thing. They're not just mixed together. They're the same thing. And they're, they're tied together because the joy is this hope for the future. This guilt is this, I've, this, I'm looking at this innocence that I frittered away. But then the hope comes back and says, now this love that this person, this innocent person, to use Dickens' words, this person so fresh from God, this love that they're giving me, that's what gives you the inspiration and the belief that you should be and can be a better person. Thank you all very much. First off, Tim, I want to tell you how much I'm uh, enjoying pushing through in your book. As a father of five, uh, which I think as we were talking earlier this morning, maybe about 10 years further along uh, mm -hmm. than, than Tim's family, I find myself uh, moving through this book and nodding, smiling, and in some cases just flat out laughing. <laughs> uh, you just, uh, 
there's such a, a, a piece there for me that just it, it, it's spot on. And it touches and connects us to, to our parenting culture. I also just want to tell you, I really appreciate you have a, what I might call a bottom up approach uh, to your writing and to your research. And there's such a nice uh, uh, humanity to it uh, as, well, you, as you. you work through people's stories. And so uh, that part I'm just enjoying remarkably. So we're going to go through a few questions here together that I've prepared for, for Tim. And then we'll take some time to uh, let the, the audience ask a few questions as well. Okay. So, all right, Tim, the one that stood out to me that I want to start with in your book, you talk about what you call the travel team trap. Mm -hmm. I'd be interested if you could describe that for everybody and then talk about how parents can avoid following into the te travel team trap with their kids' activities. So the, the youth sports have changed over the decades. When I was a kid, I rode my bike to the local Little League, and it was almost unthinkable that you would play anything else than the local recreational league. But also, probably most of the hours I spent playing sports was, was pickup sports. Then we moved, uh, we got married, had a kid, moved to Montgomery County, a wealthy suburb outside of DC in Maryland. And we found increasingly people would come up to us and say, oh, there's this one great baseball program. You know, the, the coaches are all former minor leaguers and that sort of thing. And as a baseball player, I thought, that's awesome. If I can get my son coached by this. But we still, still stayed in Little League. And then one year, I. Um, my son really wanted to try out for the travel team, and I said, okay, because frankly, I thought he'd get cut. He ends up making the team, and we, they say, okay, winter workouts for baseball for 12-year-olds. Winter workouts start January, and the first day of the winter workout, and this is the first sentence of chapter one, coach says, baseball isn't fun. Winning baseball is fun. <laughs> so that, for me, embodied the travel team ethos and some of its harm, which is turning a game into a job and making children think that the point of sports is just they have to be the best, they have to practice it all the time, they have to uh, set aside other interests for this, and there's something to be said for that pursuit of excellence, but it becomes a job, and it destroys family culture, because you end up at a lacrosse tournament in Delaware every other weekend, rather than having family events. So I would actually, I tell a story in the book of, my son's friend, who always used to come over and play baseball in the field behind our house, and when Charlie was on this team, I'd always have to, we'd always have to say, no, Charlie's got practice. No, Charlie's got practice. And then one day, he called, and we said, yeah, come on over. And Charlie just cut practice. They played baseball for half an hour and caught snakes in a creek nearby. So the idea that somehow they made the wrong decision still plagued me a little. So that's part of why I call it a trap. Parents who, who aren't super overambitious parents still get sucked into this. We've had coaches say, if you want to have a chance of making JV, you got to play baseball year round. I've had parents tell me, well, the Little League is now horrible because all the decent pitchers are playing in it. So parents get trapped in this thing that takes up all their time. It costs about five times as much. But the worst part is kids who specialize in sports suffer, not just physically, they blow out their knees and their arms, but emotionally and psychologically. The, the, the most de depressing finding, I mean, more anxiety, et cetera, but the most depressing finding was that specializers, kids who play one sport and they play it at least 10 months a year, they had a lower opinion of their own athletic ability than the non-specializers. Why? Because they probably ended up in some regional tournament and they looked around and they said, I've spent my whole life on this one thing and there are 200 people better at it than I am just in this one gym. It's fine to learn that you're not the best. It's fine to fail. But when you've had your parents for their actions and what they spend their time and money on, they've made you feel that your value is caught up in that activity, then failure feels devastating. And I think it was important too how you highlighted, right? There's the sports piece of that, but we're seeing it across youth activities in general, mm -hmm. right? In theater and music and other ways too that it becomes that specialization. The part I resonated the most with too was that temptation to turn parent-child time, right? Father-son time. Uh, yeah. into a practice session, right? No, so, it had to be a training session. Very, very, one last quick baseball. That's not true. I'll probably talk about baseball a lot more. But for now, um, there was one game where my son's travel team lost all the games. But they have like a three-run lead. Lead-off batter hits a ground ball. My son at shortstop bobbles it. The guy reaches base. OK, that's fine. It's not fine. The other team pours on five runs and wins the game. And I was just thinking, gosh, I got to hit Charlie more grounders. And one day he says, hey, can you come out back and hit me fly balls? 
I said, let's go to the other field where I can hit you grounders because you're playing shortstop on this team. We went back and forth, and he said, Dad, I just think fly balls are more fun. <laughs> My son asked me to basically have a catch with him, and I tried to turn it into a training tra session. Yeah, that's where I saw that reflection yeah. saying I, I, it, it, it's easy to slip into. It is a trap. Another thing that I thought might be worth uh, some discussion, I, I appreciated in your book as you talked about what you called the forgotten virtues of community. Mm -hmm. uh, can you talk a little bit more and explain what, what you see as the role of various communities in helping us uh, overturn some of these parts of modern parenting? So there was a wise woman who wrote a book once titled It Takes a Village to Raise a Child. And um, it was, in fact, in, in Salt Lake City, uh, Boyd Matheson was the one who said that's one of his mottos. Parenting is not supposed to be a solo act or a, a duo act. The nuclear family is absolutely the most important sort of institution in America, but it doesn't live on its own. It can't survive without support. It's like saying the heart is, or the brain, whatever you think is the most important organ in the human body, it depends on others. And right. so community is what supports the nuclear family in all sorts of ways. One thing, and the, the line I used in the book after being in Salt Lake City was, um, so uh, Kim Gotchnauer, a, a demographer over there, said, I think, she said, the Catholics in America with the most children are the Catholics in Utah. Pregnancy is contagious, which <laughs> would shock some um, epidemiologists. But, but what it meant is that if you're in a place where other people are, we absorb norms from our neighbors. And a tight-knit community often is going to have a norm of a, you're going to have a lot of children. B, other people are going to help you. C, if you see somebody else's child that needs help or needs to be yelled at, it's OK to do it. And some of these are the virtues of community. But as parenthood becomes more and more of this super planned thing that we agonize over, we postpone it, we're intentional about what we're going to do, we feel, OK, this is my undertaking. That's Stephanie Murray quote. Have the children, but they're your problem. And so that's in an absence of community, where people see themselves as these atomized individuals who aren't sort of allowed to call on others. The great thing about community is that it's relational rather than transactional, that you help somebody because they need it, and they help you because you need it. And nobody's keeping a ledger. Those are the virtues that are forgotten in a lot of today. So what would you see as being some of the main communities that can be those primary support. The most important community is going to be religious communities. Yes. And the most important for a couple of reasons. One, statistically speaking, throughout American history, especially if you look anywhere below the upper middle class, a, a church community is the center of community life, a church congregation. Second, because um, religious communities are going to be more likely to be family oriented because they're going to be more likely to be explicit in asking you to look beyond yourself. And again, not just in the homilies, but my own pastor back home is uh, Father Paul Scalia. And he hates it when I say this. But I say, I don't think the homilies make that much of a difference, as much as the Boy Scout troop, the, uh, you know, the, the youth groups, the, the donut hour, or whatever. That these, these little platoons that we belong to, um, when Robert Putnam wrote Bowling Alone, he said 50% of civic activity emerges from religious institutions. But beyond that, you know, libraries, bowling leagues, use Robert Putnam's thing, uh, little leagues. My own town where, we're, where we live now, McLean, Virginia, has a great little league that people do see as this hub. Like if you, if a kid says, oh, you know, my mom, uh, she, she had a uh, really bad accident and her, she's in the hospital, that Little League will be the people who bring you the casserole. So it's not just religious uh, entities, but it is, it's got to be something you belong to, something that you signed up for, something you say you might call we. You know, you talk about your local parish, they're we. You just talk about BYU, they're, they're we. That, that, that would be one defining trait. I appreciated your discussion, too, around grandparents and around extended family and that that in some ways is, is a challenge for many in modern society? When, especially when it comes to raising children. Statistically speaking, if you get help from your parents or your siblings raising your first child, you're more likely to have a second child. And so I spend a little bit of time, now I don't remember whether it's my last book or this book talking about it, but one of the things that makes family indispensable is you don't mind asking them for favors. And in part because you don't mind saying no if, if to somebody asking you for a favor. But with a friend, you're sometimes, oh, I don't know. I feel bad asking her to pick up my child. I know she's so busy. Your sister, you'll always ask her. 
Um, and again, your sister might say, no, I'm not doing that, but, that, but it still forms that thing. In Israel, 70% of mothers get help from their own mothers in raising their kids. In Europe, it was 35%. I don't have the data for the US, but that's, so I talk about our culture being family unfriendly. It's the subcultures that are family friendly. That might be the most important distinction, is that mom, is that grandma, sister-in-law, et cetera, that they contribute to raising family. And so when, the, the, when Hillary named her book It Takes a Village, she was citing an African proverb. So we think anthropologically, historically, the village kind of meant cousins and in-laws and, and grandparents and aunts and uncles. And so that's uh, absolutely essential. And it's lost in a lot of American culture. I love that description of a, of a we community, right? Yeah. And we feel that. So I mentioned that as I've been moving through the book, for me, it's been a, a, an amazing reflection back on the last uh, nearly 30 years of parenting in my life. But of course, we've got a lot of students here that are looking forward to mm -hmm. that part of their life. Uh, any particular thoughts of advice or counsel you'd give to, uh, with, with your research, with what you've learned for a rising generation that has parenting that's uh, in front of them? Yep, so the, there's a Donald Rumsfeld quote about the Iraq war where he answered some question by talking about, well, there are known unknowns and unknown unknowns. And I always love that line because it sort of preached this level of uh, humility. In, in the book, I also cite Socrates saying, wisdom is knowing the extent of your own ignorance. But I also quote the third philosopher I, I cite in that regard is Mike Tyson, who said, <laughs> everyone has a plan until they get punched in the face. <laughs> so my main advice would be that you should prepare for adulthood and career and know that your preparations are going to get thrown out the window. And one of the ways that I think about it is, what is a job that, what is a skill set that goes well with parenthood? And some of them, you can make it happen, but it's really hard, being a lawyer, for instance. My friends who are lawyers, they uh, often have many, who are successful lawyers, many, many weeks where they're barely ever at home. The two that jump out at me as very family-friendly jobs are being, in my line of work, an editor. And then the other is being a nurse. And these are very family-friendly in two different ways. Being an editor, the woman who edited the first draft of my book, who cut 40,000 words, like, ruthlessly, like <laughs> Genghis Khan mowing down enemy armies, she mowed down my words. Um, she um, had two kids at home, two young kids at home informed me partway through editing the book that she was having number three. So I don't know if my book takes credit for that or not. Um, <laughs> but she, uh, she would edit on her own time. Like we'd set timelines, yet every two weeks I'll turn around a chapter for you. And if I say, when can we get on the phone? She'd say, I will call you. When my children are napping and I don't need a nap, I will call you. <laughs> she was in charge of her day-to-day -day life while working this job. And she was probably putting in about 10 hours, uh, about 20 hours a week. And then when her baby was born, she shut down to zero. But then she can ramp it back up. And nursing in a totally different way, where the demand is bottomless. So I have a friend who she sometimes works 70 hour weeks in the summer when her husband, a school teacher, is home. And then other times, she works zero. And then other times she works as a school nurse. So that's a, a way to think about a career path. I mean, this should start in high school, really. A career path that is family friendly. The other thing is, I've always had bosses who have said to me, your family is more important than this job. And I don't think that's terribly common, but that's what I would look for in an employer, is somebody who knows that family is more important than a specific job. In fact, I uh, emailed Paul earlier and I said, tonight, my, my family were doing just this nightly prayer. And so whatever you had me scheduled for at exactly that time, I'm going to step out and do it with my family. And at first, I almost felt a little bit guilty. I thought, if anybody's going to appreciate that, it's going to be the people at the Wheatley Institute. So just um, assert yourself as a family person if you are. If you just step in. When I introduce myself, people know right away I have six kids. And I, if you assert yourself in that regard, a lot of people will accommodate and respect that. We have a little bit of time for some questions. So if you have a question, we'll, uh, I, I think I'm seeing through the lights in the back. Uh, if you can speak real loud and project, uh, Tim will take your question. How do you think we address the social media with the social contagion effect of these ideas that beat down ourselves and spread like wildfire? 
I think that, so the question is how do we address the social contagion of um, these harmful ideas? So as a parent, my first response is A, don't give your kids, let your kids have social media, don't give them smartphones. B, try to build up communities of support that make that easier. Um, I think uh, my generation has a benefit, sadly, of seeing you know, my nieces and nephews slightly older. My brothers didn't even think there was any problem with just handing them their old iPhone, and we see the harms. But we also know it's really hard to just have our kid be the only one who's not on Instagram. So we build up community schools. We meet with other parents. Now that we're the old parents for our younger kids, we meet with other parents starting in second grade. Hey, we are never giving our kids a smartphone. We are not letting them on social media. Don't let your kids tell you everybody has to. On the other end, and I identify with this to some extent because I use Twitter even though I know it's bad for me in a lot of ways, um, how do we uh, battle those influences? I think nothing replaces in real life human interaction. Developing, I mean, almost like for me, I think of a, a smartphone addiction, developing accountability part. Hey, we're going to get together, none of us are going to look at our phone, and we're going to be there in person. You can't beat it. The, the people who are writing these algorithms are geniuses at it burrowing into your mind. And I use the analogy in the book of a garden that you've cultivated, and an invasive, invasive species comes in. That's the way I think it affects family life. When your kids look at the, the social media all the time, the medium is the message. And the message of social media is going to be, you are an isolated, atomized individual. Nobody was really ever going to know you or love you or anything. And then you compare yourself to others. Oh, I'm inferior to that person. Or you hear this terribly negative um, thing. The mama sphere I write about uh, is really corruptive, where you know, either m motherhood is hell or look how easy it is to make homemade uh, cereal for your kids for breakfast. <laughs> um, and they're always like ballerinas who somehow live in farmhouses. And <laughs> if, if you don't have either, you feel inferior. And um, so I, I'm not an expert in how to break yourself from it, because otherwise I wouldn't be on Twitter anymore. But as a parent, we really try to build up a community of support, talk to our, our kids, uh, friends, parents, et cetera. I really appreciate it. There, there's some great parts in the book that do talk about how social media and that landscape is getting into our parenting ideals, into our parenting culture. I, I found it really insightful. The stuff I get fed on Facebook, the algorithm, is always like a hitting drill for your eight-year-old son. <laughs> and it, again, it takes self-restraint for me not to click on it and be like, that would be awesome. Yeah. <laughs> Let's go hit ground balls. But fly balls are more fun. <laughs> right. Another question? Yeah, here in the front. Um, I'm curious what your take is on the influence of the therapeutic culture on mm -hmm. teaching people that they're isolated, uh, atomized individual. I'm a marriage family therapist by trade, and I see it in my own, uh, my own uh, the culture of my own uh, yep. discipline that it's like, yeah, we try to help marriages, but really what we end up doing is teaching people that they matter more than their spouse. What, what role do you see therapy playing? So uh, I haven't gotten to read Abigail Schreier's new book, she, um, Bad Therapy, and that's about children specifically um, being taught to almost deify their own emotions. And it goes from sort of come to face with your own emotions to these, like, they become your god. So some of it, I think, is trickles down from being a secular culture, that um, we're not really ever going to be satisfied with a materialistic understanding of human nature. So we come to make sort of little little gods in our head, and I think therapy can um, play into that. But I mean, I think you put it really well. You know that the, there are terms that are, reflect good things, like self-care, et cetera, that then become uh, these absolutes. And autonomy is another one of them. And so you can't do marriage if you hold autonomy as a, a highest good. And that marriage involves sacrifice and vulnerability. And so I don't know how much of it has to do with the, with the therapy, but this one woman came up to me after a, a talk at AEI I gave, and she said, I would love to get married and have children, but I know that having children will, I'll set, take some time away from the workforce, it will make me a little bit economically vulnerable, and if my husband were ever to leave me, then I would be in a really bad situation. 
So she has decided to not get married and have children because she needs this insurance plan of always having to be self-sufficient economically. And that really has sunk into a significant portion of the culture because marriage necessarily involves you becoming dependent on another person. Again, like two different organs in a body. And that's a, a vulnerable position to be in. So I, the, the, the philosophy of our age, the anthropology of our age, cuts against either having kids or getting married. I think we have time for one last question. Here against the wall. Yeah, something I'm curious about. I know a lot of men who have uh, a difficulty reconciling being a provider and being a dad at the same time because they feel like they conflict. What advice do you have to men on how they can be dads and they can be happy to be, be at home or to maybe break some gender stereotypes in order to be, to be present for their children? I mean, certainly there's a conflict. I'm here with you and not with my wife and six kids. But the first thing I would say is, as you look for a workplace, um, look for a family-friendly workplace. Just, I, have, I, I sort of accidentally, just because I always enjoyed it, started building up my identity as a father. But then I realized the advantage. When any time I went to my boss and I was like, hey, by the way, I'm going to have to take Friday off because of my kid's t-ball game. They were like, OK, because they knew that I took that seriously. So just, again, leading with that and not being apologetic about it. Um, the other is, I think one of the reasons that men today have trouble with the idea of fatherhood is because they see the, the mainstream media will say, well, you need to become, uh, I, there was this question, this Capitol Hill briefing, this one woman asked a similar question to you, but the way she asked it, I thought was terrible. She said, how can we get men to take on a more equitable share in caregiving? And I thought, that doesn't sound appealing to me at all. How can we get men to take more seriously their role as dads, <laughs> is how I would put it. And being a dad is itself super fun. But I, I'm highlighting gender differences, actually, here, that women mothering and dads dadding are two different undertakings. So I play pickup basketball with my kids. And even though one of them is, he claims he's taller than me, but I think it's just his shoes. But even though he's about my height, I still beat him in basketball. And so he starts practicing just to beat me, and it's so much fun. And then I have a, a nine-year-old, and I demolish him in basketball. He tries to shoot, and I just swat it like, all the way across the court. And it's so much fun. M my wife doesn't have an interest in demolishing her children in basketball. <laughs> so a big part that I would do, sort of, the, that the culture should do, is to really paint the picture. Parenting is, dadding is going to involve career sacrifices. It is going to, and it's not babysitting when dad is looking after the kids. That term really rankles uh, mothers when they hear that. You're not, the dad isn't babysitting. But also, dads don't have to be, you know, just male moms. Dads are going to be something else. The children need it. It's fun. It's awesome. And you do owe it to your family to sacrifice. And the funny thing is, it's happening more and more. And it's just not being said out loud enough. There was this guy at my Catholic parish once. A bunch of us were standing around talking. And he said, oh, you know, my only job is to uh, earn the money and pay the mortgage. And I said, that's just not true. You're, you're your kids, like, you do the, the timing at your kids' swim meet. I saw you the other day walking in the same park as me with a kid. But he sort of thought that's what he was supposed to be. So if your only choice is a sort of feminized manliness, uh, feminized adult manhood or like I'm tough, you know, Andrew Tate following guy, then there's not going to be a middle. My middle would be, there was an old term on the internet called wife guys, guys who are always talking about their wife, and, um, and proud dads. And building up those images, showing that to people, I think would address your, your question. Join me in thanking Tim Carney for his time. <laughs>